All right, everybody, welcome back. We're going to do a Q&A today. I'm also going to let you know how the business is doing. It's actually doing pretty good. I'm kind of happy right now. So let's jump into some Q&A from Alliance Homes. How did you get into doing this, and how long have you been doing this? Depending on what you mean by how did I get into doing this, I've been doing this kind of work since I was literally just like a little, little kid, uh, just barely big enough to pick up the tools. I just came from a hard-working family in West Texas, and everybody worked on everything all the time. It wasn't really optional. How long have I been doing this? Well, I've been a handyman like professionally a few times before, but I was mostly working for homeowners. I was working for lower wages. Typically, I was single, didn't have a lot of expenses. My house was paid for and everything. So um, I've been doing it on and off my whole life, and I got into doing it because I've just always done it. Uh, from Sean... Krajewski, I do not have any trades or construction experience. Do you have any suggestions on how someone with little to no experience could start? So, yes, uh, number one, first thing, most important, there's nothing you can do. If you're a person who has a brain and who has YouTube, there's literally nothing you can do. Just get on YouTube and watch enough videos. Obviously, start with the simple stuff, but, I mean, you can start with, Doorknobs and deadbolts, uh, fire alarms, like smoke alarms, super, super easy to do. Even swapping kitchen faucets and garbage disposals. If you go look at my, like, an average month of handyman jobs video, I go through a whole list and just make a list of what you can do and start there. But then for the stuff you can't do, go buy the tools. Watch the videos, learn how to do it. You can do it. Everybody can. I could take a 12-year-old girl and give me a week with the tools and the materials, and at the end of a week, I could have her building a cabinet. You know what I mean? And stuff is not that hard. It's, not, it's never as hard as you think it's going to be once you actually get into it. Uh, Garrett Mesnerich, how, do you, how long do you honor your estimates? So for me... Uh, I do have like a disclaimer on my estimates that says they're good for 30 days. Now, if the price changes on something, you know, 15 days from them, I'm still going to say, hey, the price of this went up. You know, my estimate was for the materials, and I can now tell you that the materials cost more. But, you know, for a good client that I'm not worried about losing, or that I, for a good client that I don't want to lose, I'm going to honor that as much as I can. If it's just a materials price change, then it is what it is. Now, my labor, that's not going to change. But my, my estimates do say that they're good for 30 days. Bobby Quinn, is there any easy way to differentiate which materials do or do not get covered in your trip fee? So, this from another video I did where, you know, I don't charge for, say, screws if I'm using five of them or if I'm using 20 of them. Now, if I need 500 of them and i got to buy a little bucket of 500 screws, I'm going to charge for those. So as far as, I mean, the overall question, is there an easy way to differentiate? I'm just going to say if you want, you can set a dollar amount, but it's not something you should have to think about a lot. Essentially, if you've got to go buy a package of something because of this job, bill it to the job, you know, or bill half of it to the job if you're going to use half of it. And if you just need a handful of screws and you just need, like, a little thing of mud to put over a hole, if you need something that's, like, the value is $1 or 2 or $3, then I'm still, gonna, I'm still going to include that in what I bill. Like, it's, not, it's never free. But let's say I buy, like, a faucet, and the faucet costs, like, $89 after taxes and everything, and then I end up using half of a tube of caulk. Well, then I'm going to call my faucet materials price, I'm just going to call it like $93. Or maybe I'll just go up to 95 But the short answer is, if it's just a little 1 or 2 or $3, I'm not saying don't bill for it, but you don't need to break that down line by line by line, five screws for $0.87. Cents. You know, you can just say hardware, and all of the hardware you used, call it 5 bucks. You know? uh, <clears throat> and you had another question, Bobby. What is the breaking point between standing your ground at a fair price versus conceding to lower rates? That's always on you. That depends on your market. That depends on what kind of clientele you have. One of the reasons I do property management is because my clientele, um, 
they know my rates and they're happy with my rates. And if I go to a new property management company, they're typically going to expect similar rates. Now, some of these companies do have like a $30 an hour handyman, and some of them are using contractors that are expecting way more than I charge. But overall, I think we're all in that 80 to $125 trip fee range, and we're all in the, let's say, 50 or 60 to $100 hourly range. Uh, I've mentioned before, just so nobody's confused, I don't charge by the hour. Um, I just have a $125 trip fee, and then if it costs more than $125, it costs more than $125. I receive uh, work orders, I do the work, and I invoice what I decide to invoice. And what I decide to invoice is just based on my knowledge of what an electrician might have been charging, what a plumber might have been charging, what other handymen are charging, what I've charged in the past, what I've charged in the past when somebody was upset about it, which is very rare, or what I've charged in the past when somebody was very excited about it lets me know it was too low. But it's a, it's a constant moving target. It's like waves on the ocean, and you're always figuring out where you're at. But I stay in a certain range. I know what's fair. And I, I'm at the high end, but I'm within a fair margin. <laughs> so as far as what's the breaking point, you got to figure that out. What I'm going to say is whatever you're charging, try to charge more. If you start getting a bunch of pushback, then drop it back down. A couple months later, try to charge a little more because then you may not get pushed back because maybe they find you to be more valuable at that point because you've been doing it longer and they really appreciate you. But you should always be testing a little bit higher and when you get the pushback, you come back down and you stay in that nice range where if they don't ever say anything, they're probably fine with it. Uh, let's see. Do you work holidays and weekends? Can you take vacations? Um, I work seven days a week. Now, I obviously, I'm not going to work Christmas. I'm not going to work Thanksgiving. There's a lot of days that I'm not going to work. I'm not going to work my wife's birthday, my kid's birthday. I will work my birthday. I'll work Father's Day. I, I've done both of those in the last year. But I work seven days a week. Uh, and this brings me to a good point. If you're watching this channel because you want to start a handyman business, and we're going to assume that you would like to be successful, it's really important. You're going to work nonstop. Nonstop. If you have this idea of getting weekends and taking days off and being home at 2 p.m., if you're dreaming of what the success at the end looks like instead of getting motivated about the hard work it takes to get there, it may not be for you. Uh, I wake up between 5 and 6 every day because I have newborn twins and they wake me up early. And I take care of them. And as soon as I'm done taking care of them, I'm showering and I'm going through all my paperwork here on the desk and I'm getting my day together and I'm heading out the door and I'm working all day. Uh, I might get home at 3, but if I do, it's because I came home a little early because I know that I'm going to need four hours on the computer to invoice, to write quotes, to just... Oh, there we go. All right, my camera's being weird. I know I'm going to need a whole bunch of time on the computer. Um, I work often until 9 or 10 at night on the computer between helping my wife with the kids and everything else. It's not like I sit down and I never get up, but unless I'm needed for something or unless I'm just going to get a cup of coffee, most days I'm doing something productive, not relaxing, not for me, but for my business, which is for my family, between 7 a.m. at the latest until 7 or 8 p.m. at the late, at the earliest. Those hours are all for work, 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 work. Now, I'm getting to a point pretty soon where that's not going to be the case. In fact, I've got my son working full-time, and there's another handyman I met that sounds like he's interested in some work, and I actually need somebody to take some more work. So if that's the case, it's going to be real nice because I'm going to be farming even more work out while still remaining 100% busy working myself, but there's going to come a point where it's going to be most of the work getting done by other people, and you know, the dream, if I'm going to allow myself to dream, is that I'm driving around town in, say, two years, I'm driving around in a nice pickup truck, not this shitty old van I have, in a nice pickup truck, wearing some clean clothes, uh, knocking on doors and talking to tenants and talking to property managers 
and looking at the work my guys have done and sort of just making sure my quality control is up. Uh, that's the dream, but it's taken me, it's been 20 months now, 20 months of just working nonstop, of killing myself. And I do mean killing myself. It hurts. My muscles hurt all day, every day. I'm always stressed. I haven't had any extra money most of the time. So be prepared. If this is what you're getting into, you need to go into it with the idea that you're going to sacrifice for at least a couple years to get to that really great point. So, uh, no, I don't have holidays and weekends. I take off individual days planned ahead of time when I have to take them off. Uh, are you on call nights and weekends? I'm never on, to me, on call means if they call you, you have to go. So I'm never on call with any of my companies. However, my companies do know that they should call me if they would like me to do some emergency work because if I can say yes, I will say yes. And my rates go to $250 or $300 just as a trip fee, if it's an emergency, after hours, weekend, whatever. If I have to stop what I'm doing and they're saying, hey, Ray, please, can you go take care of this, like, immediately? Then, yeah, that's 250 300 bucks just for the trip fee. So I'm kind of on call, but no, nobody can ever tell me that I have to go. Let's see. What do you recommend on getting better clients? I feel I, feel I screwed myself by putting handyman in the business name. Um, actually, I think those are different questions from the same guy, Clayton Van Ruyen. I hope I say that right. What do you recommend on getting better clients? <clears throat> Number one, you have to be willing to get rid of clients to get better clients. You don't have time for better clients if you're busy with your shitty ones. So if your clients are constantly negotiating your price, if your clients, you know when they're not good clients, you just do. Like I've got property managers where they'll well, had property managers where they'll start questioning a lot of things. What time did you get there today? What time did you leave? How did you do this? Why did you do that? If they start asking a whole bunch of questions and you know you're doing good work, now if you're a hack and they're asking questions, they're asking questions for a good reason. But if you know you're putting out good work and charging fair rates and they're questioning, 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 there's nothing wrong with them doing that, but they're not your top client. They're not what your goal should be. So step one, find more clients. Step two, as soon as you have more clients, drop the shitty ones. Um, I feel I screwed myself by putting handyman in the business name. I disagree only because of this. This channel, as I keep mentioning, now the purpose of this channel is to help out guys who are trying to start a bulletproof business. And the way that it's bulletproof, one of the many ways, is that you're working for property management companies. They are not contingent on how the economy is doing or how the market's going. People rent year-round because they have to. These are rental houses. The price will reflect uh, how full they are or not. So they're just always going to have people in them, which means toilets are always going to get clogged and sinks are always going to leak. So for property management, no, you haven't screwed yourself by putting handyman in your business name because property managers refer to you as a handyman. And when they search for you, they're searching online for handymen. Now, if you're a contractor, be a contractor. But don't be a home maintenance specialist. You can if you want. It doesn't really matter if you're tracking down the property management companies and asking your service at offering your services. Then call yourself whatever you want because at the end of the day, what they want is a guy who can fix stuff for money. So as long as you're that, they don't care what's in your business name. Now, if you're working with homeowners, yeah. They hear handyman and they imagine somebody who charges $20 an hour, $15 an hour, maybe 30 at the most. They don't imagine that you're very skilled. They don't imagine that you're valuable to them. Uh, and they, they treat your business relationship as if it's a personal relationship. So if you say it's going to cost $400 for a half day of work, they feel like you've personally insulted them. Now, if you tell a property manager it's $400 for a half a day of work, they may or may not be okay with the price, but they're not going to take it personal. They're just going to decline or they're going to say yes. So, no, I mean, call yourself a handyman because you're a handyman. Uh, what state are you in? I'm in Arizona. I'm not giving any more info than that just because I don't need, uh, I just like my privacy. I've got a family. I've got a life, you know. If somebody wants to put in 15 hours of research to track me down, I'm sure you can. I'm not trying to hide anything, but uh, I'm in Arizona. Jones Randy says, 
do you have a travel limit for the $125 trip fee? Eh, it's a yes and no. And again, so many of my answers go back to the idea that I have a very, very good reputation with my very select group of property managers. Um, if I go somewhere and I feel like I had to drive too far, you know, if it's a 45-minute drive for sure, you charge an extra. If it's a 30-minute drive, probably charge an extra. But if I book a whole bunch of jobs in the same part of town, um, then I don't charge extra for getting to that part of town because it's a one-time drive to get over there, and then I might knock out five jobs while I'm there. But, yeah, I, I do charge more for traveling but it's pretty rare, and it has to be a situation where they would obviously agree because they know the town as well, and they know what end of town I live in, where they would just obviously agree that it was a pretty far drive. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. They don't complain. But again, 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 if you act like a business, if you treat them like a business, if your relationship is a good, healthy business relationship, um, you have so much leeway in everything that you do. If you're honest and if you have integrity, they'll know after a year that you do and you'll, you'll just bill what you bill and they're not going to question it if you're fair. Uh, let's see. Krasimir Zarkov. Do you do all of your work alone? If you need to invite a helper, how do you deal with him about the job, timing, and payment? So I work alone. Yes, almost always. Uh, for many reasons, mostly because I like to control my quality. I just I like to be in control of things in general. Now, if I invite a helper, how do I deal with him about the job, timing, and payment? So I've actually brought my son on full-time, and I'll tell you how I handle working him, and it's how I will handle everybody in the future as I add more handymen to this business. So here's the deal. This is the deal. If you want to work for me, here's what we do. I send you jobs. Now I use Jobber software and by the way Jobber if y'all wanna like see this video and give me money to say this that would be pretty cool but Jobber's not paying me. I love Jobber software though. I just do and I'm, I'm absolutely certain there's 15 other really great ones. In fact one of my property managers uses Property Meld. I don't think it would be the perfect thing for my business but it's also great software. Their business got way better. like Way 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 better. I almost stopped working for them and then they got property mail. But anyways, I use Jobber. Now my son has an account that he's created in Jobber which is managed under my account. So when I'm sitting here on the computer creating a job, I just simply click on assign to him. Now he gets on his app on his phone or on his computer and it'll show him what jobs are assigned to him. And then I expect him to do essentially exactly what I do. So when he gets his jobs, he goes through, he makes his own calls and schedules his own tenants for whatever time of day or week or whatever he wants to. That's between him and the tenant. He does the scheduling, he shows up, he does the job. When he's done, he sends me pictures and tells me what he did. And then I go back into Jobber and I type in all the work description again because I like to be in control of things. I've built this into something uh, that is really good, really, really good. And I'm not going to have anybody, no matter how much I trust them, even family, using whatever wording they want to use, doing things however they do it. As long as the work is good, I am the interface between my business and the company. So I do the invoicing. And what I do is I invoice two blocks. When they ask me to itemize, I don't itemize stuff. I just don't, period, end of story. I don't do it. If you have a tenant that needs me to itemize things or a homeowner that needs me to itemize things, sorry just not gonna. I'm gonna tell you materials cost this much and I'm gonna tell you that uh, the labor costs this much. So when I invoice for my son's work, I invoice the job he did exactly the way I would invoice it if I did it. So for all these one-off jobs that are $125 for every single one of them, I'm gonna invoice the $125 as if I did it. I don't care if he took 10 minutes to do it. I don't care if he took eight hours to do it. If it's a job that my clients are used to receiving a $125 invoice for, that's what I invoice for. Now, if it was more complex work and it took him five hours, I can still tell, because I'm in communication with him, how long it would have taken me and what I would have invoiced. So I invoice for his work 
exactly what I would have invoiced had I done the work. Doesn't matter how much time he took. And then I take 30% of whatever it is I pay him. Now I'm thinking, I'm on the fence, I still have to talk to my accountant. I might drop that down to 25%. I'm really not sure. I'm looking at the amount of time that I'm putting in for each of his jobs that I'm taking that 25% from. And I'm looking at how much time am I spending on the phone with him, guiding him through some of the work that he does. How much time does it take me to create the job in my software, to invoice it, to do all the admin stuff. Just in general, how much of my time is it taking to employ him? And I want to make in the ballpark of that $100 an hour. And I'm feeling like <clears throat> right now the 30% is fair, but as he needs me less and I'm answering the phone, you know, there's days and it's nothing about him. He's still learning stuff. There's jobs he shows up on and I don't hear a peep from him. I just get pictures because he knows what he's doing and he knocked it out. There's other jobs where he might call me 12 times. So soon I think I'll drop it to 25% because soon I think he'll be more independent and just be kind of running around town handling stuff. And I'll probably stick with the 25%. But that's how I do it. And this solves so many problems. There's no show up time that he can be late for. So I can't be mad at him for being late. I mean, he could be late with a tenant, but he's already aware, as will be everybody. And he's my son and I love him to death, but he's already aware. I think he knows that if he starts not showing up for jobs, or showing up late without calling. It's so easy to just call and tell them you're late. And your phone can only be broken so many times. You're not out of a service area. Hardly ever. He knows if I start getting calls and complaints, I'm just not going to send him work. Because if I send him work, and he makes my business look bad. It's not a personal thing about my business. That's what maintains this household. You know, I got three kids and a beautiful wife and some other people living with me at the moment. Uh, health insurance is $1,600 a month. I've got a mortgage to pay. I've got bills to pay. And I cannot let anybody put that at risk. But he knows that. So, But here's the, the, the issues that it solves is there's no showing up late because there's no like 7 a.m. show time. Um, I'm not going to get mad at him for just all these things when you manage employees. If he diddle, dilly-dallies around, if he maybe he gets along with the tenant really well and they end up bullshitting for like three hours, not my business. I just really don't care because I'm still just going to bill what I would have billed had I done the job. It's working out really well so far. So that's how I'm handling um, as far as how do I deal about job timing and payment. And as far as payment, I'm 1099ing him. He's aware he needs to set back his own tax money for paying his own personal income taxes. And I use Zelle to pay him at the moment. I'll probably get something set up where I can just automatically transfer but that's fine so out of the toolbox tinker any concern about property management verifying your hours spent ie surveillance camera uh, no because I don't charge by the hour I've never given them an hourly rate and even if they had a camera up and knew how long I was there with no hourly rate and I charged 350 bucks and they said hey it looks like you were only here for an hour. Why you charge three fifty? I'm not going to be rude. I'm going to be super professional, but I'm just going to say that was what I thought was the value of what I did. That's what I think you would have paid somebody else, an average other person. So, again, I'm not apologetic. On the other hand, I have some outstanding clients, and if they had a problem, I've had one in the year and a half, one time where I got a call from a very good client, one of my best, and he said basically, hey Ray, I saw that you charged like 600 and something dollars uh, for this fence, or these gates actually is what they were. They were metal gates, uh, and I basically took the old wood off and put new wood on. I also had to bend some stuff back into shape. I had to do a little digging, and it was like, uh, like that half inch to one inch gravel, like small stones, but like in with a lot of dirt. I put a lot of labor in. But in the end, he called and he said, hey, I noticed you charged this much. And I said, well, you know, that much was materials. And I was there for X number of hours. And it was hot outside. And so that's honestly, it's what I thought was a fair price. And he said, well, 
the homeowners just, they're kind of complaining because they just don't see how it could be that much. And I looked back at what I did and I thought, you know, getting my $100 an hour if I charge what I charged. And I said, do you think the homeowner would be happy if I just dropped it? I think it was like 640 or 630 And I said, do you think they'd be happy if I took like 100 bucks off? And he said, mm, probably. They'd, they'd probably be all right with that. So I redid the invoice. I lost 100 bucks in a year and a half. One time, I dropped one invoice by 100 bucks. That client is still an amazing client. I would say, on average, $2,500 a week. That includes materials and labor. But like, he tends to pay out once a week. And usually when he's cutting a check to reimburse materials and pay me for everything I've invoiced, that check is between two to 3000 every single week. I don't care about the hundred bucks, you know. You just, you got to think about who you're dealing with. You got to know who your priority clients are. But for me, if they're checking my time, like if it becomes a thing where they're worried about it, they're just not the right client for me anyways because I have shit to do. Do they require receipts for materials? No, they don't. There was one company in the beginning that did, and even with them, one day I just stopped sending receipts, and they never asked for them. Uh, CB, I'm going to assume CB stands for cock block. Are you tracking all of your times? Yes, I keep... Here it is. No, it's not in here. Yeah, here it is. This guy right here, this is just like uh, my journal, and I just keep it open to the page. This is where I do my mileage as soon as I get to Circuit K in the morning for gas. I document my mileage at every single job I come to and leave. I write notes in. If I get to a job where I need to do a bunch of measurements for estimates, I put all of that in there. So it's, it's literally like a journal that has my times, that has my mileage, that has my notes, that has... Anything I just think I might want to remember, somebody might ask me a question in the future and say, hey, did you notice such and such? And I can say, yeah, I did. I think I put it in the invoice, uh, but it's in my journal as well. So, yeah, that's it. That's how I track my time. Travis Gibson, do you think that bad work like this... Oh, so he's referring to a video uh, called How to Keep or Lose Property Management Companies. I think I videoed some just horrible, horrible work that somebody did. The paint didn't match or anything. They, they had done touch-up paint. It's a bunch of bad stuff. Do you think the bad work like this is because somebody is undercharging and wants to save time and money, or do you think they are charging what they should be just to care enough about, just don't care enough to do a good job? Uh, it's both, honestly. Most property management companies aren't going to hire like the super cheap guy that's going to do that because they kind of know they've most of these property management companies have been through a lot of guys like a lot of guys when somebody shows up and they can't they don't have an LLC they don't have insurance they don't have a whole lot of things uh, and they're charging you know they're like I'll oh, do it for $25 an hour you would think they'd want to jump at that because that's a cheap price but no they're not because they understand when somebody shows up like that that they're not a professional and they want professionals. But yeah, sometimes this is because somebody is undercharging for their time and they're thinking that everything needs to be cheap and then they're going out of their way to make it cheap and they shouldn't be. Sometimes it's that. Most of the time, and I have no clue if they're charging the right amount of money or not, but most of the time when you see that work, it's just a lazy handyman. It's just, he's probably charging... 50 or 60 or 70 or 80, you know, it's he's not cheap. He's also not expensive. He's just kind of somewhere in that gray range, and he's just lazy. You know, he probably got to the point where he realized, like, my guys don't go behind me and check me all the time. I'm not worried on any particular job that if I take a shortcut that they're going to come and see it. They're probably not, but here's the thing. A year later, they're going to see it. At some point, they're going to see it, and I just do good work because it's the right thing to do because it keeps my clients happy, and when my clients are happy, they keep me in a bunch of work. So chances are, just lazy handymen, you can get by with it for a while. You can get by with it for, I would say, almost six months. You could do shit work, as long as it looks like it's not shit work. And I find it all the time. I've, I've taken um, towel racks off the wall, 
and I go to like because they're loose and I need to tighten them up. So I go and I take it off, and it's it's secured into expanding foam. Somebody had a towel rack come off. They were told to fix it, so they went and they took it completely off, sprayed expanding foam into the hole, waited for it to set, and screwed it back into expanding foam. You can get away with that for a little while, but not for very long. And that's what I think most of that is. Uh, what's your process for matching paint on patches? My process is I take sample, and I take it to Home Depot or Ace Hardware. They're not all the same. You're going to start getting to know uh, which guys at each individual place, like which businesses and which employees are good at matching paint or suck at matching paint. Some of them will tell you you have a color that can't be matched, and it's bullshit because you can go right down the road to the next day's hardware and they'll match it, and they'll do a good job of it. But I, I take a sample, and I take it and get it matched, and this ties in. That was Travis Gibson. That's his last question. But David S. asks, how do you get the correct color and sheen of paint when the owner doesn't know? Cut out a sample somewhere and get it matched? Question mark. So here's the process when I need to match paint. Uh, one thing you should know, kitchens and bathrooms typically are semi-gloss. They're not always. Not everybody knows this, but they are and should be semi-gloss. The rest of the house can be flat, satin, or semi-gloss. It doesn't really matter. But as far as sheen... That's an eyeball thing. You got it. You'll get good at it when you do a bunch. You just will. When you go to Home Depot, they also have a little uh, board that you can hold your sample up to and sort of like check it out and see what the sheen looks like. Oftentimes, the guys there are good at guessing the sheen. I try to always go if I'm borderline. I'm like, ah, is this a satin or an eggshell, or is this a satin or a semi-gloss? Then I'm gonna go err on the side of assuming it's flatter rather than assuming it's more glossy. A gloss is really going to stand out and shine at you if it's up against a wall where everything else is flat. A flat is going to stand out, but it's going to look, it's just going to be a muted area rather than a shiny area. So my process, here's where I like to take samples from. I usually cut them off with a razor blade. Uh, one really good place, if the door trim is the same color as the walls, is the door trim. And you want to go on the hinge side up near the top so that when somebody opens the door this way, you know, there's a wall here and a door here and the door opens into here. People rarely are in this area, so it's not going to be dirty. Nobody's going to have touched it. You don't go down low because that's where the pets are. <clears throat> you go up high and you get it on the wood. And the reason you do it on the wood is on the sheetrock, uh, you've, got, you've got a skin coat of mud. And when you go to scrape into that, it's just going to, like, crumble and stuff. So not always, but a lot of the times, unless it's a good semi-gloss or above. So I go to the door trim, and I shave a piece off there. Now, if the trim's a different color, then you got to get it off the wall. You might be able to find a baseboard that's clean behind the door or somewhere, but it's got to be clean. And if you have to clean it, clean it gently because you can affect the outcome of your final paint color just by roughing it up too much. Uh, closets are a really good place. If I can get, a, if the closets are the same color, so what you do is you go in the closet, get a sample from anywhere, because that's a closet, people aren't spending time in there, cut yourself a sample off, but go into the room that the closet is part of, go into that room and hold your sample up and make sure that it matches, because you'll get painters who are supposed to paint a whole house, and what they'll do is they'll, they'll match the paint that's already in the house, because it doesn't cost any extra. And then, let's say the closet looks just fine and they're using the same color paint, they won't uh, paint the closet and they'll say they did. So your paint chip from the closet is going to be original paint and your paint chip, your paint on the wall that you're trying to match outside of the closet in the bedroom, that's going to be uh, a matched paint but not a perp. So when you take a sample and you try to get it matched to match a match, it's not going to match just right. So make sure it matches. But yeah, uh, I like to get it off of door frames and trim and stuff like that. If you have to dig into some sheetrock, I use a blade and I cut a nice big chunk out. But I do it like, again, in the closet or somewhere very hidden and I fill that hole. You never know it was there. That's how I do my paint matches. David S. says, how do you get the correct color? Oh, we already did that. Jay Jones, how many services do you offer to property management companies? On move-outs, do you do all repairs, painting, flooring, cleaning, etc.? I do everything, man. Um, 
my managers eventually get to know of a few jobs that I don't do, but essentially I let them know the few things I don't do and everything else I do. Even if I've never done it, I'm about to do a welding job. I've got to go buy a welder to do this welding job. It's not like a super important one. It's not structural. It's like a mesh that's on a security door. You know, the, the bars are the security. The mesh is just there so people can't stick their hands through and unlock it. They sent it to me. I said, hey, I don't do welding, and this really needs to be welded back on, so you should send this to a welder. Then the tenant told me when I was scheduling another job there that another guy was coming by to do that job, and it turns out he couldn't do the job because he is a weld. Now they send it to me again. So I'm going to send him back an estimate for probably like 500 bucks, and I'm going to go buy myself a $300 welder and get paid $200. Essentially, I'm not going to learn on the job. I'm going to practice here a little bit, but really my first job, they're going to pay for my welder, and maybe it takes me five hours because I don't like my work and I keep redoing it over and over. It may be a mess. I don't know, but they're going to pay me to learn to weld and to buy a welder. So just do everything, man. If you can do it, do it. And if you can't do it, figure out if you could do it and learn how to do it. Maybe lose a little bit of money on a job learning how to do the job. And then in the future, you can always say yes, and you can charge whatever you're charging now but get faster and faster and faster at it. Jack of all trades. Are you only doing property management work? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, I don't work for homeowners. The one exception is I work for my property managers on their personal homes because they like my work and they hire me to work on their homes. And uh, if it is a homeowner that the property management is bringing on board. So they're not renting out the home yet for the homeowner, but they're in the contracting phase of getting everything set up for that homeowner to become somebody whom the property management company leases out their home. Then I'll do work for them. If it's sent to me by the property management company, even if I am invoicing a homeowner, and the same thing if it's a homeowner leaving a property management company, but they're using them as their realtors because uh, maybe they're going to sell the home now, then yes, I'll do that. But again, it has to be through the property management company. They are like my insurance, uh, essentially, because they're going to make sure that I'm taken care of because I've taken care of them. I cannot stress enough. Your priority is to make their jobs easier. You need to be reliable. They will take care of you till the cows come home if you take care of them. Tim Van Nguyen, in your state, do you have to be a licensed electrician to do any sort of electrical work? Uh, I cannot get a straight answer on this. I've asked so many people. Sometimes the answer I get is if you have to disconnect service to do whatever it is you're doing. Well, I never disconnect service. I just get shocked every now and then, and I don't really care. You know, If I'm changing an outlet... I'm changing it, I'm changing it, maybe I'm doing 10 of them, and on the third one, I accidentally, <clears throat> and that's fine, I just, okay, move on, keep going, it ain't going to kill you, so I don't disconnect service, but I've had other people tell me yes, and I've had other people tell me, no, 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 even if you do disconnect service, you can change outlets and switches, same thing with plumbing, you know, I've asked many times, can I change a faucet? And they say, well, yeah, because you only have to shut off the shutoff valve. But if you want to change the shutoff valve, you have to disconnect service to the house. So I don't know, man. You're going to have to ask. But I have asked. I've asked a lot of people who should know. And I get different answers from everybody. <clears throat> uh, John Doe, what do you do if you can't fix something? Uh, in a cocky way, I want to say I just fix it. I figure it out. But, yeah, no, there have been times when I couldn't. And I just... I just call them and I say, hey, I'm trying to get this fixed and I, I feel like this is uh, maybe not out of my skill level. Maybe if it was my house, I would put two or three days into it and get it figured out. But I don't feel like I should be learning something on the job on your home and I feel like you should get a professional for this. They will appreciate that all day long. It lets them know that you're not going to go just try to rig stuff up in their houses, you know. They don't want you to rig stuff up. So if you can't fix it, you just tell them that you can't fix it. You apologize and say, hey, I'm sorry. I tried. I do feel like you should try uh, unless you just know for a fact that you shouldn't. But otherwise, you know, give it a shot. 
and then put an hour or two into it. And if you can't get it figured out, if you can't get it done, just let them know that you can't. And don't invoice them ever if you can't get the work done. Just don't. That's it's bullshit. As far as your reputation, don't don't do it. Why? If you didn't fix their problem, they shouldn't be giving you money. Uh, Craig McKillwain. Craig, M C I L W A I N. McKillwain, why does this video not have one million views? Love you, dude. Craig, Craig, I love you too, buddy. I do. You're right. This video should have a million views. The reason it doesn't is because I don't have enough people sharing it and hollering from the rooftops how amazing I am. Um, but thank you, Craig. I appreciate it. I thought it was a pretty good video. He's, I think, referring to my how I started and grew my handyman business video. <clears throat> thank you, Craig. I appreciate it, baby. I love you, too. ZG Outdoors, what information did you put in the email to the property management companies? I'm going to do a separate video on this for sure, but essentially it's an introduction. It's literally like, hi, my name is blah, blah, blah. I'm a handyman. Here are the services I offer. If you guys could use any of my services, please reach out and let me know. You can call me anytime, 24-7. You can tell them what your rates are if you want to tell them what your rates are. There's a lot you could do, but imagine the person sitting on the other end is a property manager who is looking for a handyman who is reliable and punctual, uh, have good grammar, don't have a bunch. If, if your initial contact with them makes you sound like you didn't graduate high school, and there's nothing wrong with not graduating high school, because I guarantee you, had I not graduated, I could still be doing what I'm doing, making the money I'm making. But don't look like you didn't graduate high school. Be a professional. Introduce yourself. Tell them what services you offer. Give them an idea what they might expect on rates. Be very polite and courteous, and just say, if you have any work that you would like to send me, please feel free to just send it. If you'd like to talk first, feel free to give me a call or send me an email or text me 24-7. Anytime you want, I'm here for you. Uh, Dennis Bartolucci. Bartolu Bartolucci? Maybe? Thank you for such an insightful video. Do you carry any type of liability insurance? Um, yes, I do. I couldn't even tell you who they are right now. Um, when I first started this, I literally like Googled handyman insurance. It was on some Facebook pages too, and I went to a couple places, put in the data that they asked me for. Uh, I probably need to redo it soon, actually, for sure, because I know when I gave them the data, I was like, I was hopeful that I would be making like 80 a year or something. Like whatever the number was, it was low. So I'm sure I need to tell them that I'm making more so they can charge me more. But just go on Google, type it. If you're really super concerned about getting the best insurance, go to a local agent like State Farm or somebody. I'm not saying they're the ones. I don't really have an opinion. Uh, but go to a local agent with a local office who can help you out, and they can sit down and go over everything with you, man, and they'll get you nice and set up. And if, you don't, if you're not really super concerned about it, then just go on Google, type in handyman insurance, go to the first three sites that pop up that don't say... You know, you got to get through the advertisements first. They say ad, like paid advertisement. Get past those first three places that pop up. Get a quote done. Pick the one you like the most. Do you have a way I could contact you and pick your brain for a bit? Appreciate the help and video. Uh, kind of. You can comment right here, and I have so far, I have answered every single comment. All of them. Probably going to set up a Facebook at some point, in which case I'll start sending you all there. That would be a good place to communicate. But as of right now, if you want to pick my brain, just go down to the comments. And if you want to ask me 20 questions, as you can see right now, I'm doing a video right now. But I also personally have answered every single one of these questions to the person who posted. So I am not out of contact. I'm not out of reach. You can always reach me by just commenting on one of my videos and ask me all the questions in the world you want. I get excited. Like, there's a good dozen guys that I know of so far through this YouTube channel that have quit their jobs and started their handyman business. By following, they literally will message me and say, Hey, man, I just quit my job, and I did exactly what you said. I found 50 property management companies. I emailed 10 of them. 
four of them responded, and I've got interviews set up with them, and I'm super excited. I'm super excited, too. I'm done working for other people. I'm done making money for other people. The money that comes out of my work goes into my pocket, and it's for my family. So uh, do you have a way? Yep, so that's how you contact me. Jonathan Smith, do you itemize your invoices or charge by the hour? Neither. I itemize in only one way. I have materials, like the line item says materials, and then it's a list of all the materials I used, not with a price for each material, just materials with a list and a price total for materials. I have the same thing for labor with a list of everything I did and one price for my labor. That's how I do it. Yes, you're going to have a hard time doing that starting off. I was able, for the most part, to do that starting off, but I also think I might have just got lucky. A lot of them are going to want hourly rates and itemizations. I don't do it, and if you have enough property management companies to pick from, don't work for the ones who want you to itemize because it, it takes time. Everything, time is money. Everything you do takes time, and that's money. I work all day, every day, and I would rather spend more of it with my family so no, they're not getting 30 minutes or an hour out of my day while I go through receipts and type in every stupid little thing for them. If I'm doing good work and my work doesn't go bad six months or a year later and no tenants are complaining and your homeowners are happy and my rates are okay, then you don't need to be worrying about every little detail trying to make sure I'm not screwing you out of three bucks. I probably am screwing you out of three bucks. If you're worried about that, stop it. Uh, Jacob Pierce, do you have other social medias? No, Jacob, I don't, and I should. Maybe I'll fix that tonight. I really, like, every day I'm like, damn it, I need to set up Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, any of these platforms. Uh, I need to. I haven't. Maybe I'll get around to it tonight. We'll see. Do you use a business credit card? This guy was mentioning about, you know, you can get, like, airline miles and stuff like that. No, I don't. I'm against credit. I hate credit. I I've been debt-free about half of my life. I'm not anymore because I took out a loan on the house, which I had originally bought with cash. But I just I don't like using credit. I'm scared of credit. I At one point in time, I had a lot of debt, and I got it all paid off. So I probably will, but here's what I'm going to do. is like Right now, my account might say $8,000 on Saturday, and it might be empty by Wednesday. When I start seeing my account always up here, and I'm not ever worried that I might run out of money and literally not be able to purchase materials to work for a day or two while I'm waiting on payments, I probably will. I'll use some sort of credit that's going to get me like Southwest Airlines miles or something to that effect, but not yet, sir. Last one, Phil Jans, 600 a day is about 150000 a year. Why would you have to figure out how to pay for the bigger van with that salary? I'll tell you why, Phil. I have a large house. I have a large family. I have a lot of responsibilities. Health insurance is $1,600 a month. Mortgage is over $1,000 a month. My family doesn't eat junk. We don't eat spaghetti and shit or hamburger helper. My family eats meat and vegetables all the time. I've got cars that break down. I've got a swimming pool that needs a lot of chlorine tablets. I put a lot of money into, you know, when my wife... One of the beautiful things about her is she loves making other people smile, and she's really big into gifts. And if it's somebody's birthday, anniversary, or anything else, you name it, she often comes to me. In fact, just recently, uh, her mom was going through some stuff and just not having a great day, nothing major. She's just having a really horrible day. She's in another state taking care of something that needs to be taken care of, and it's not going well, and she was in an emotional place. Just bad day right? And my wife said, hey, I know we don't have a whole lot of money to just throw around, but I would like to order my mom a pizza. Can I have like $20 to just try to order her a pizza? I want to surprise her with it and have it delivered to the place that she's at right now. And I sent her 50 bucks. And I said, why don't you spoil her? You know, spend 35 to 45 uh, Get her like a lava cake dessert or something to go with it, you know? Um, the last place my money goes is to me. I use money on me to maybe buy some stuff for this channel, like the webcam I'm using right now, which I expect to maybe in a few years, if I have enough viewers, maybe I'll start making some kind of income on it. But otherwise, I buy... Uh, sh this shirt is from Goodwill. 
I spend 20 bucks at Goodwill on a few shirts that I can ruin and throw away in a month. I buy new pants. I buy the tools I need. But I don't go around spending money on me. And honestly, a new van, as much as I would like to have one, there are other things that my money can go towards. I have twin one-year-old boys. You can't even imagine how many things I could buy for them or spend on them that is going to give them a better life, especially diet. I mean, we got a big grocery bill because this family eats real food, real healthy food. And I've got a beautiful wife who loves making that healthy food for us. Uh, so that's that's why. I mean, 150 a year, I know my household budget is over 100 a year. And out of that 150 a year, I have to pay personal income taxes. Um, and like I said, health insurance, 1600 bucks a month. There's a lot of expenses. And that's why. It's because I'm not going to spend the money on me. Now, if the business could make more money by me getting a bigger van, uh, then I would. You know, I was in a pickup at one point. And yeah, I would have done what I needed to do and spent the money I needed to spend to get a van because I can't have my shit getting rained on or stolen out of the back of my truck. But yeah, my money goes to my family. So uh, thanks, guys. If you've stuck around for this whole thing, I don't see a timer, so I don't know how long it's been. But it's been a long one. Hopefully you got a lot of good info. Let me reiterate, if you put anything in the comment, you will get a response. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, I respond to everybody. If you need to communicate with me, do it that way. If you appreciate the time I'm taking, because my family's in the other room right now. I've taken about an hour out of my day for them. So if you appreciate this, like, subscribe, share, promote my content for me. I'm going to be back here doing more and more and more of this. Bottom line is stop making money for other people. Make it for yourself and make it for your family. You know what I mean? Do it. Just do it. Take the leap. Go and do it. If you're willing to work hard, if you're willing to put in what it takes, it's been 20 months for me, and I'm, I'm this close. I'm going to have a business, like a real, the kind of thing I used to look up to when I was a 14-year-old boy and saw the ones who were successful with their construction businesses. This is going to be a real thing that's going to put me and my family in a comfortable place. But it took a lot of hard work, and all you can do is start, man. Start on the weekends and evenings if you have to, but start so that someday you can stop giving other people your money. You can stop letting them take all the profits from your labor. So you all have a good one. Thanks for tuning in.